everybody. Welcome to another episode of Allure of the Poor, sponsored by Dracina Wines. I am your host, Lori, a WSET Level 2 graduate, a champagne specialist, and owner of Dracina Wines in Paso Robles. And I am very excited today to have Dave McGee with me, another Paso um, winemaker and I have not, this is actually the first time I'm getting to taste his wines, but we have, I keep trying to get into that tasting room. Um, but so welcome, David. Thank you for joining oh, Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the invitation. Okay, so normally my very first question is the origin story. How did you get into wine, all of that? But, but I have to go off my typical here and I have to go with my change my first question because your background you started your career was really in working <laughs> with electrophysiology and I read that I was like oh my god that's like amazing so you went you were it's responsible for like the heart and all of that how do you go how did you get into that field first and then how do you go into that field, into wine? Well, first of all, electrophysiology wasn't my first career. It was, I don't know, the second or third career, I guess. I originally got a couple of engineering degrees and went into the aerospace business. And I worked at one of the big aerospace companies down in the Los Angeles area, doing primarily radar and stealth aircraft design. Um, so I, I did that for a number of years down there. And then figured it was time to do something different. Didn't know what that something different would be. Went back to business school, got a business degree up in the Bay Area. And from there, I got into the medical field. And so I worked at a bunch of medical technology companies up in the Bay Area. Uh, some startups, some bigger companies. I worked in electrophysiology. I worked in interventional cardiology, interventional neuroradiology, orthopedics, spine, urology, a couple of other things. Wow. Um, and so did that for about, I don't know, 15, 20 years, something like that. And then from there, I really started making wine in my garage as a hobby. Uh, my wife and I lived up in the Bay Area. And uh, then I got a little more serious. I took the online version of UC Davis's winemaking program. And about that time was when we kind of figured we'd had about enough of the Bay Area rat race. It was time to do something different and go somewhere else. And I'd grown up in Bakersfield, so I was familiar with the oh. area. Uh, we came down here, we loved it. We loved the wines being made and figured we would just move down here and figure the rest out later. So uh, we did. I uh, still didn't know whether I really wanted to go in the wine business or not, but I figured I should probably work for a couple of local wineries and get my hands dirty, literally and figure out if it was something I wanted to do. So I worked at uh, Via Creek and Alta Colina wineries for a couple of years before starting up Monochrome. Wow, so uh, Bakersfield, my uh, college roommate was from Bakersfield and I did spend a, uh, my freshman year, I did spend uh, Thanksgiving there. And yeah, um, yeah and uh, some other break. It wasn't spring break because I know we weren't going to Bakersfield for spring break. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we uh, I went to school at Whittier, so down by L.A. Um, so we took yeah. that drive up to Bakersfield. Um, well, yes. we used to always joke that growing up in Bakersfield was great because you were 100 miles from anything you'd want to do. If you wanted to go to the ocean, it was 100 miles. If you wanted to go to L.A., it was 100 miles. If you wanted to go to the mountains or the desert, it was 100 miles. The bad thing was you were 100 miles from anything you wanted to do. So there you go. <laughs> so when um, so again, we're originally from New Jersey. My husband and I are from New Jersey, but we have the winery in Paso. And then he got offered a job in Fresno. So okay. we are we live in Fresno, um, mm -hmm. which is a lot closer than flying six hours and then driving three yeah. hours to get to the winery. But mm -hmm. um, if that's similar to Fresno, when we when we were here looking at houses, everybody just was like, oh, Fresno is great. You can get anywhere you want in like two hours. You can go skiing in right. two hours. You can do this right. in two hours. Yeah, I'm like, but, but does everybody yeah. just leave? And everybody just leaves on the weekends. Like yeah. it's like mass exodus. <laughs> yeah, well, certainly where we live in Paso, you know, we don't live not too far from 46 going east over to the Central Valley. And on pretty much any given Friday afternoon, that, that road is 
full of people yeah. coming from the Central Valley to come over to Paso or Pismo Beach or San Luis Obispo or something like that. Right. And the same is going out on Sunday, Sunday evening. Right. Same thing. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, you started making wine in your garage and mm -hmm. um, what did, what were you making and how were you getting your grapes? I mean, I guess from the Bay Area, it's a little easier, but what were you making? Well, it, so, so first of all, the, the style of wine making at Monochrome is directly uh, following on what I did in, in the garage. But I started out, um, you lived up in the Bay Area and there was a place that specialized in, for, you could get like a big 10 gallon pail or a couple 10 gallon pails of either frozen must if you were making red wines or frozen juice if you were making white wines. And they had found sources that were pretty, pretty decent vineyard sources, uh, most of them either in California or Washington state. And so the first time I got a couple of 10 gallon pails of Sauvignon Blanc juice from a vineyard up in um, Washington state somewhere. I forgot the exact name of the vineyard, but um, you know, basically you just thaw it out and you go from there. So I, uh, I already, I was sort of experimenting and playing for things. I thought, well, okay, I'll try to make a couple different versions of this. I'll make one that's more of a, a Sancerre style you know, sort of a little bit on the clean side, minimal oak uh, characteristics. Um, and then I made another one that was a little bit more California um, Bordeaux style. And, uh, you know, just treated them different, treated each little carboy that I was working with differently just to sort of see how they would behave and how they would change. And uh, it came out pretty good. I, I think the highest compliment I got, some neighbors of ours were French and they had um, the woman's mother and father were visiting from France and I poured some of this and they're like, oh, this, this tastes like a Sancerre. And I was thinking, oh, that's kind of what I was hoping for, but I wasn't really they're expecting like, it. Yay! You know? So yeah, that was, I, I tried not to look too overly excited about it, but uh, that was kind of fun. Okay. And that, that's like the beginning of all ending too, right? Once you, you're doing it just for yourself and then somebody tastes it and they're like, oh, this is really good. And then that little that you know, voice goes off in your head. Oh, maybe I should do this yeah. more. Maybe I should do this for real, right? Yeah. So I did that for I think one once or twice up in the Bay Area, and then about that time we moved down here. And so when I moved down here, I, I was working um, just basically acting as a seller rat at a couple of other wineries, but. On my off time, I was able to talk some of the local vineyard uh, owners into selling me some some fruit, and so I was making it directly from fruit in, in that case, and um, you know crushing the fruit and mainly whites. I did I did some Syrah. I did a couple of other things uh, on the red side, but um, a little bit more on the white side. Okay, and then um, when you first started. Um, when you first started Monochrome, you were doing double duty, right? You had a full-time, you had a job on top of the winery. Are you still doing that or are you 100%? No, I, I was, um, once we moved down here, I was, I was still doing a little bit of consulting in the medical field for a couple of years. But by the time I started Monochrome, I had phased out of that. And so I've just been focused on Monochrome since, since I started that. But awesome. uh, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. Okay, so now the thing that catches that caught my eye is, and you you've you've alluded to it, is that monochrome is all about the white. It's all about white wines. So, what what about white wines calls your name that you're like? This is what I am focusing on um, because I don't know too many wineries that that do that. In fact, I can't really think of any that focus on, on whites. There's loads that focus on red. Um, right. So what about white that, that calls your name? You know, I, I think my wife and I have always enjoyed white wines. Uh, I think my wife usually prefers white wines, although we drink a bit of both. Um, some of it was also just a contrary nature that I have. And some of it was also you look as you suggested, Paso, for example, I think at last count, there are about 350 wineries in the area and substantially 350, well, 349 of them now are focused either exclusively or primarily on red wines. And you go into most of them 
and they'll have one or maybe two white wines. And some of them make a serious effort at making really nice white wines. But a lot of them, I think it's fairly clear that it's not really where their passion is. You know, they don't put as much energy and effort into making top quality, complex, interesting white wines as they do into their reds, you know? And the wine, the white wines, a lot of them are a little bit, you know, kind of second-class citizens in the sense that they take the juice, they put it in a big stainless tank, they ferment it, it comes out nice and crisp and refreshing, but definitely doesn't have the, the character, the complexity, the interesting aspects that you can get from the best red wines. And that was really what sparked my attention, both the fact that, you know, I didn't want to be just number 351 doing red Rhone blends or, or red blends period around here. Um, but it also just seemed like there was a need and an opportunity, you know, white wine seemed to be underserved both literally and figuratively around here. And um, I think that's really what sparked me to go down this road along with a lot of encouragement from my wife on that point. <laughs> well, you have you you have to find your own niche, right? You have to be able to, you know, stand out amongst everybody else, right? You don't want to be that little itty bitty, you know, fish in a massive, massive pond. And Paso is really kind of a massive pond in in some respect. So you have to be right. able to find a way that makes you stand out from everybody else. So right. I, I get it. And I love the name monochrome. So what, did you come up with the name? Did your wife come up with the name? How, how did I, that whole evolve? I came up with the name and um, there were a couple of reasons why I thought it would work. We went through a lot of different, different brainstorming ideas, but you know, monochrome technically means one color, right? So given that we were only gonna do white wines that seemed to fit, but I also saw a parallel there. I'm a bit of a photography enthusiast and I saw a parallel to photography in the sense that some people at first glance think about black and white or monochrome photography as being less complex or less interesting than color. And yet most fine art photography is done in black and white. And most photographers will tell you that it's harder to make a black and white photograph work because you can't just rely upon a pop of interesting color to hold someone's attention. You've got to get all the basics right. You've got to get the subject matter, the composition, the tonality, or it just comes out flat and boring. And, and I think it's similar with wine. You know, with, with red wine, you can throw a lot of oak and tannin and extraction and cover up for a lot of things. But with white wines, you really don't have that luxury. You've got to get the basics right. You know, the flavors, the acidity, the balance, um, complexity, that sort of thing, where it just comes out kind of flat and boring. And there are a lot of white wines that are very quaffable, but at least in my opinion, sort of one dimensional and boring. And uh, those are all the things that went into thinking that monochrome would be a good name for what the project was all about. And the, the label, <clears throat> or when you look at monochrome, it's got the, I'm going to hold up this beautiful bottle for the people who are going to watch it to see. Um, and then the, the light is killing it. Um, the O the, and the monochrome in the chrome part is green. Is that a shutter? Is that? Like uh, a yeah, that, that O is kind of representative of, a, of an aperture blades in, in okay. camera lenses. But I, use, I used the wrong term. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the green color really was chosen very specifically for this because I didn't want it to be just the standard gold, silver, red, black that, that everybody uses in the wine industry. Um, I wanted something that was going to be stand out and be reflective of what we were doing. And so if you look at the color of white fruit, uh, it's actually shades of green going into shades of mm -hmm. yellow, depending on the variety and the degree of ripe and all that. And so I actually took a lot of photographs of uh, white grape clusters and sort of broke down the colors. And, and a good friend of mine had done a lot of design and worked at a big ad agency down in LA. And so he, he helped me with laying out the, uh, the overall label design and the logo design. I love it. It's, it is um, simple and complex at the same time, you know, and that is 
white wine also, right? It can be simple, but you're you're finding the complexity within it so that it's not just the, you know, sit on the back porch and pound and don't even know what you're drinking white wine. Right. Um, but I love it. And that um, the color, you brought up the colors. Um, when I tell people that, uh, you know, white grapes go through verasion also, and there are shades of mm -hmm. that. And I think that's not a very well known fact out there that you know it does go through variation um i would love to see some of those photos uh do you have your do you have your photography in the tasting room do you have your I do. yeah i have uh probably about i don't know eight or nine <clears throat> uh photographs that i've blown up and framed and uh hung on the, the walls of the tasting room of course we haven't actually done any tastings indoors <laughs> for the last year so but it's all been out of the we're opening <laughs> yeah, we're well, we'll reopening now. Uh, we're going to reopen actually on next Friday because the weather is so horrible here I right know. now. It, nobody will want to sit outside and get rained on. So we'll uh, we'll give it an extra week and open next Friday. Okay. So I am thirsty. I have been waiting mm -hmm. like since you shipped me these to try these. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to get into uh, the tasting uh, and then we'll, we'll go well, on with these. Let me tell you a little bit about the, the, the philosophy behind these wines and how they're made. And it really does stem from when I was first making wine in the garage. You know, at okay. first, you don't know what you're doing. You know, you don't know what the best fermentation temperature, the right amount of oak, the right strain of yeast, any of that stuff is. So being a trained scientist, I figured I would do a bunch of different versions, change those parameters around, figure out which was the best, and then make them all like that. Um, but what I actually learned was having a lot of different versions that were all made differently, intentionally, and therefore had different flavors and different aromas and different textures to them, gave me a lot more to work with when it came time to blend. And at least to my palate, resulted in wines that had more character and complexity than if I just put it all in one big tank or one big barrel and made it all the same. You know, I always draw the comparison to cooking. You know, if you're cooking and you only had one or two ingredients, you're kind of limited, but if you have a whole pantry of different things that you can pull from, you can come up with something a little bit more interesting and complex and have more fun doing it. So that's pretty much what we do. You know, each barrel is intentionally done differently um, just to spread the range of flavors. And it's remarkable. You know, I mean, a lot of people talk about terroir and all that, but same fruit, same picked from the same vineyard, harvested the same day, and each barrel is just totally different. Different, absolutely. So, because of the way we treated it and made it going down the road. And uh, now- and then, just, then try to just layer them back together again to, to bring out different elements in the wine and try to add a little bit more complexity to them. Okay, and uh, going further on what you're talking about, you can have the same cooperage and the same toast and everything mm -hmm. in that barrel. And barrel A with the same, like you said, same grape, you know, same harvest date, same chemistry into barrel B and they're gonna be different. So are you doing that in addition to having different cooperages and different toasts? Like, are you like a mad scientist back there in the definitely, barrels? Definitely, and Definitely accentuating those characteristics. You know, I sat down when I first started doing monochrome and thought, well, what are all the different levers you can pull in the winemaking side that, that will create different characteristics in the resulting wine? Well, you could ferment it at different temperatures, for example, okay? You can ferment it at, with different yeasts. You can use different regimens for barrel stirring. You can use new oak of various cooperages. You can use neutral oak of various cooperages. You can use stainless, you can use amphora. Um, and we do all of that. So each barrel is intentionally treated differently. We might have one where we ferment at a higher temperature, one we ferment at a lower temperature. This one might be new oak, that one might be neutral oak. Some of the, the barrels, um, we, we ferment dirty, so to speak, which is basically you take the juice right out of the press with great particles and things still in it. Don't let it settle, but go straight to the barrel. And then okay. others, we would, do, we would do a 24 or 48 hour cold settle to reduce those particles coming out. But again, it, it makes for remarkable differences from barrel to barrel when you pull all those levers and do everything intentionally differently. And um, I saw on your tech sheets, you, you were also doing some uh, skin contact also. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that adds a whole other dimension. 
<clears throat> we do some skin fermentation for those of you who might not be so familiar with that. That's basically making a white wine the way you normally would make a red wine. So rather than just fermenting the juice, you ferment it on the skins. Uh, and then when it's dry, then you press it uh, from the skins the same way you would making a red wine. So do some of that. When we use that, it's usually within, you know, two to 8% of the overall blend. Uh, I've done some carbonic maceration with Albarino, which one of the wines that I sent you has some component that was done that way. And uh, it, it's really fun. It just brings out totally different elements. And some of them, to go back to the food analogy, you might not want to drink a whole bottle just of that component by itself. Um, but you know, it's like, it's like when you're cooking and you have an onion, you might not want to eat a whole onion by itself, but you throw a little bit of onion into a dish and it can do some really remarkable things and add some interesting notes. And that's the way I think about some of these components that we do where it's skin fermented, carbonic, this, that, and the other. So th I'm just thinking of how much <laughs> is going on in that, you know, during that fermentation and, and even during barrel storage and, you know, are you keeping them on leaves? Are you not keeping them on leaves? Like you, you must have a data log of so much information to, to keep track of, like, of each of these different variables. Right. And then. Yeah, they're, they're kind of excruciatingly labor intensive wines, I guess you'd say. And, um, it, it's funny, I make, I make the wines at Onyx's facility, you know, Drew, of course. Yes. So Drew and his gang do a lot of the actual hands-on work for me. And uh, I think they get a real kick out of it because particularly their interns get an exposure to a lot of unusual stuff that they would never otherwise see. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm frequently doing things that I think they're scratching their heads about a little bit initially, but uh, I think they've come to accept it and appreciate it at this point. And I think that um, on your website, I think that plays really well into what you have on your website of saying that um, you we had to follow our hearts and try out some new ideas and have fun. So yeah. that is, I mean, you're, you're doing it. <laughs> you're doing well, it. Yeah, I, the things I enjoy about winemaking is the creative part. You know, I, I wouldn't want to feel like I'm just making the same wine that somebody else has already made or just turning the crank and making the same wine year after year right so consequently all the wines tend to be totally different from year to year you know don't make any effort to replicate what we did last year basically now you have um you have some pretty interesting names uh like the ones you sent me were barrel distortion neither here nor there and sense of out of place so mm -hmm. i was looking you have those same wines last year the previous vintage but you're, there's just no, you don't have a, a set of what it's going to be. You're going into your blending right. trials and saying, you know, this is going to become this, this is going to become this. Yeah, some of them, uh, some of them we repeated. We made a version of barrel distortion every year, neither here nor there. We've only made twice uh, out of the four years that we've we bottled at this point. And, um, since about a place we only made once. Once, okay. Um, but they all, even the ones where we do the same name, they're really different wines because it's more how it turns out that particular vintage. And it's really what works out during the blending session. It usually takes about four or five passes to get all the blends worked out. It can ultimately be fun and, and a nightmare. I was gonna say, so <clears throat> if anybody has ever seen a blending trial go on, it's a whole bunch of graduated cylinders and Erlenmeyer flasks and glasses and spits, you know, spit cups and all that stuff. And I'm thinking your table must be completely filled with, with the samples. Like how many, so let, let's talk about the, this, this wine, the, um, the neither here nor there. So okay. this one, is 50, 56% Chenin Blanc and 44% Sauvignon Blanc. Now mm. you're blending, you're blending that all together, but you have barrel fermented, you have, you know, skin contact, you have, you know, so take us through what your what's in your mind as you're going through mm. these, these blending trials. Um, 
So yeah, I'll, I'll give you kind of an overview just generically of, of what those look like. And um, I should also say that the people that are involved in this, basically myself, and then uh, Riley Hubbard, who's also another Paso winemaker, and she's been involved in this project, sort of uh, helps provide a different perspective. She's kind of a collaborator on this. Uh, and then I usually run the, the blends by my wife when Riley and I think we've got them about nailed down just to get an outside Final. perspective. But I mean, back to your question, the, the way it works, let's say, let's, let's say 2018, we had, um, let's see, we had nine different or eight different grape varieties that we worked with that vintage. But because we intentionally make each barrel totally different, we really made 48 different wines. Okay, <laughs> So the first pass, you go through and you taste all the barrels just to get a sense for what they're tasting like. And even though you're spitting it all out at that point, your palate is just shot after 48 samples. And you have to have the discipline to say, okay, time out. Let's take a couple of days or a week off. And then you start to formulate some ideas of what you might try. And you come back with your calibrated beakers and you say, well, let's try 30 milliliters of this plus 20 of that and 15 of this. And well, maybe a little bit more of this, a little bit less of that. Let's try a little bit of this over here. And then you blow your palate out again. And then you come back three days or a week later, and then you try to re keep refining it. And my guardrails I use are, A, I wanna make sure each wine by itself is interesting and flavorful and well-balanced, but I also wanna make sure they're all unique from each other and they don't all start to taste the same. And that's something that I, that I really aim for. If you taste all the wines in a given vintage, they're all quite different, even though they're all white and that's intentional. And then finally, you hope to find a home for all the, the individual barrels and kegs that you have. So you don't have a bunch of wine left over you don't know what to do with. But we really don't make any effort to do single variety or single vineyard or conventional blends or even what we did last year. It's more what works out that particular vintage. So you're coming up with these, these, I have to give you credit because first of all, we all, you know, forget the name of the winery because that's a whole other ball game of making sure there's nobody out there and all of that stuff. But right. coming up with these names, um, every vintage is incredible. So you're, you're a very, cre you're creative also, which is, you can, everybody, everybody says winemaking is art and science, right? But as you've mentioned, it's not always portrayed in the wine, okay? This is a piece of art. This is, this is a beautiful wine that has so many different levels in the aromas. And then when you, when you taste it, each time you taste it there, you're like, oh, look at that. And I can envision it being, you know, okay, this was, this was because you pulled from this barrel, or this was because you pulled from this tank, or you did, you know, you did this to that. And it is a complex, it is a complex wine. It is, it is not a wine that, I, this is going to sound, I, this is a huge compliment. So take it as it means. It is not a wine that you just want to sit and drink. Like mm -hmm. you want to contemplate this, this wine. And it's, it is a, it's a, it's a full bodied wine, which, um, but it's also light. It's, it's kind of a, what, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, an oxymoron. It's light mm -hmm. and complex. It's, it's light and full at the, at the, at the same time. Um, that's, that's kind of what we hope for, you know, and you mentioned the art side of things. I, I think, I have more, I get more inspiration from other forms of art and creativity <clears throat> than I do from, from wine making as a whole. And, you know, I think if you look at other forms of creativity, whether it's, um, you know, cooking or music or architecture or painting or fashion or what have you, you really expect new people to do something different and not just do the same thing that everybody else has been doing. They have their own style to do something creative and interesting. And moreover, you expect people to kind of continue to evolve and change throughout the course of their career. And yet wine frequently, it's like, you know, you look at Bordeaux, right? Bordeaux's great, but they've been doing the same thing basically for 170 years or whatever. Um, and again, I mean, to each their own. But for me, I, I enjoy when I'm drinking wine or tasting wine, I like tasting something that I haven't experienced before. And if I had to drink the same wine every night, 
even if it was a great wine, I'd get bored with it. And so that's really what I look for, both from my own wines and from, from other wines that I, that I try to, to find and encounter. So this is actually um, uh, Chenin Blanc, 56% Chenin Blanc and 44% Sauvignon Blanc. So um, are these from single vineyards of Chenin Blanc and single vineyards of Sauvignon Blanc? And then you're treating them differently or are you even going right. into different vineyards? No, they're both from, the, the, the Sauvignon Blanc is from one vineyard, which is McGinley. It's down in the Happy Canyon area near Santa Barbara. And then the Shannon is from a different vineyard. It's, it's called Jurassic Park. It's down in the Fox and Canyon area. But once we get the fruit in, we start doing different things with it. And so each barrel is intentionally treated differently. And this wine is not the entirety of all the Sauvignon Blanc barrels and all the Shannon barrels. And they're the ones that kind of work well in this particular blend. And then there's 6% of it was, was skin fermented, uh, the Sauvignon Blanc, which really brings out some interesting, um, interesting aromatics. It has a touch of that kind of grassy grapefruit characteristic you would get from a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but they, but, it's, but it's just a hint. It's not, it's not the New Zealand <laughs> in your face. It's, right. it's to right. kind of let you know there's yeah, so you're asking about the names, and the reason for this one is that, as I indicated in the note, it's sort of originally the first time we made it, it started off with this idea we make something that at its starting point was a little bit more like a Sancerre inspired take on Sauvignon Blanc. But then we added some Chenin Blanc, which kind of brings in the lower Loire area, and then we added the skin fermented component, which brings a little bit, at least on the nose from the kind of the, the Sauvignon Blanc that you'd get in New Zealand, a little bit of that grassy grapefruit characteristic, but the palate is totally different than anything you would get in New Zealand. Uh, so consequently, it the idea was it pulls influence from a lot of different wine growing areas, but it's kind of its own thing. It's it's very um, distinctively its own. I, I had one sommelier say it was probably the least Paso wine ever made in Paso, which uh, I think he intended as a compliment, <laughs> and, uh, you know. It is, and going back to the palate, it is, um, the acidity is there. It's a, it's a well-structured wine, but it's not the, it's not the New Zealand acid bomb that, you know, makes you think you're sucking basically on a lemon and, you know, your right. eyes are yeah. tearing. Um, it really is, a, a, it is a complex wine. It, mm -hmm. it really is. Each time you taste it, each time you bring it up to your, your nose, it, there's different levels to it. It is definitely not unidimensional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's got loads of aromas. There, there is that grapefruit, lemon zest, um, mm -hmm. uh, and a little bit of, of like a hay in a good way, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then on the palate, like, like you said, I kind of would expect um, that zing of acid and mm -hmm. it's not it's not it's not in your face acid it's it's acid that says come take another sip and it and going back to your cooking reference in terms of um uh of like adding an onion what amazing it can do it's almost right. like the acid is, is like um an msg type thing where it's just enhancing everything that's in that glass it's not Oh, it's not taking on its own power. It's enhancing what is in there. So it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Now you had mentioned that you don't really tend to do um, uh, varietals, but your barrel distortion is 100% Alvarino. So I am yes. a I am a Ria Spicious like maniac, like on my bucket list to go to Ria Spicious, like I, maniac. So I am an Albarino uh, freak. And I, I will tell you that that was the bottle I wanted to open today, but my husband was like, no, 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 you're gonna open this one. This is what I feel like having. So that's why that's why that one got opened. Otherwise the Albarino would have been the, the, the first one to go. So tell me about the Al Albarino. Where are you getting it from? What about Albarino? You know, th there's not a lot in the United States. There's some in Paso, um, but so 
Why? So, uh, yeah, when my wife and I moved down here about nine years ago, we'd never had an Albarino before, and we had a really nice bottle. And so when I started planning this, that became a must-have variety because we both really enjoyed Albarino. And um, this, again, had its origin in, in my garage here. I, I got some fruit, uh, some Albarino fruit from Bar Vineyard here in, in town and started playing with it. And... Um, then when we started making it in production, we, we got a different vineyard called Plum Orchard Lane. It's in the Templeton Gap area of Paso. And, you know, one thing people would always think, well, you know, it's, it's very different climate from what you have in Rias Baixas, for example, where it, it's cooler, it's more damp. Uh, even though the Templeton Gap area is among the cooler areas within Paso, it's still quite a bit warmer and drier than what you would get in the, the homeland for Albarino. And, and I think some people tend to think, well, you look at, for example, Edna Valley, uh, cooler area, probably more appropriate for that. And, but on the other hand, how do we know? You know just because Albarino has been grown in Rias Baixas doesn't mean that's the only place it will be good. And so I've been really pleased, even though this part of Paso is warmer and drier than the native homeland, uh, I've been really impressed with the fruit that we get and the quality of the flavors and things like that. It doesn't taste like your textbook, uh, Rias Baixas Albarino, which tend to be more acidic. A lot of them are done in big stainless tanks. They're a little bit more one dimensional for my palate. But I've heard that a number of the top boutique producers in Rias Baixas are starting to do some of the same things that, that we've been doing. Not that they copied us, it was more coincidence, I'm sure. But a little bit of, of barrel fermentation, a little bit of lees exposure, a little bit of skin, skin contact, that sort of thing. And this was one where um, I wanted to create an Albarino that had a little bit more character and complexity. And so we made, even though it is our only single variety wine. It's actually made up of about five different versions that were each made differently. So different neutral oak, French oak barrels, some stainless barrels. This one has some skin fermented component that, that I, I hand de-stemmed the fruit, hand crushed it, uh, let it ferment on the skins until it was dry and then pressed it off. And then there was a little bit that was carbonic macerated, which that derived from another wine that I made from the wine club, which is, was called the X2 and the X2A, which were we have experimental wines where I do something sort of interesting and creative and call it an X wine. And if it comes out at all good, I'll release it to our wine club members. So this was the X2, X2A, which was the, the carbonic macerated Albarino. Uh, and then there's an X3, which is something totally different that, that'll be released here in a couple months. It's incredible. Like, and you're, you're saying, oh, well, you know, I do something a little more experimental and a little bit more, like all of your wines are so hands-on creative and experimental in a great way that that it's it's almost funny to hear that you have even in your eyes something even more <laughs> more experimental um, well the, the exploration is a totally different area it's more of an exploration on texture and tannin structure in white wine so it, it's it's skin fermented Viognier, it's other types of Viognier, it's got some Roussan and some Grenache Blanc in it. And it, it's just a totally different wine, but it was a different different thought experiment that was behind it. Okay, so you also had, uh, you had mentioned that in, in a website somewhere you have, not having a home vineyard means that we are free to source grapes from any of the great vineyards. Now you say that you have 400, right? 400 miles. So your vineyards that you're sourcing from are spread all over the place. So I'm thinking you are during harvest, right? It's all white. So you are probably fast and furious during harvest time to mm -hmm. get the grapes in and then to do all of these micro fermentation, micro, you know, ferment, fermenting and then micro barrels and all of this. Like, right. do you sleep during harvest? I mean, most winemakers, we don't sleep during harvest, but like you really mustn't sleep. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't have it as bad as it sounds, I think, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, Riley, who I mentioned earlier, does a lot of the, the vineyard visits because she's got her own brand, Hubble Wines, and then she worked at Desperata. So she's out there a lot anyway. 
And so she checks on a lot of the vineyards for me and that, that eases things up quite a bit. And then the actual winemaking occurs at Onyx's facility. And so their people do a lot of the, the legwork. I mean, I'm down there pretty much every day and I provide directions on specifically exactly what I want to do on a barrel by barrel basis. But Drew and his team are fabulous and they do a, a great job, um, you know, first scratching their heads, I guess, at the nuttiness that I do and then going ahead and doing it and doing a good job for me. So um, I appreciate all that. So I think as a result of all those things, I actually do get some sleep during, during harvest period, although it is a pretty busy time, of course. Right. So um, tell me, tell me a little bit more about your Shannon Blanc. Uh, the, it's Jurassic Park Vineyard. So with a name mm -hmm. like that, like what's the story behind it? And I was looking into it a little bit and it's like, like significantly different on the east side of that vineyard versus the west side and the, in terms of that soil type. So tell right. us about the vineyard <laughs> and why so you're we, doing a shen in, in a varietal. You know, yeah, so it's, um, it's considered an old vines vineyard by California standards anyway, and certainly by white fruit California standards. I think a lot of it was planted back in the 1970s. Um, and I don't know where the name came from either. You know, I don't know whether that was before or after the movie franchise. If it was after, I'm a little surprised that nobody's been sued about it, but <laughs> not my vineyard, not my problem, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's, they're you know, kind of like pseudo head trained vines. They're, they're old and, um, you know, it, uh, it, it's been a little hard to get some of the fruit as ripe as we would have at first liked it to be. Uh, I think part of that is because the vines are old and they probably crop them a little higher than they, they could. But for whatever reason, you know, we struggle to get much above 20 bricks on that fruit. Um, but the flavors tend to come out pretty good. It also tends to have really nice acidity. And so when we blend it into some of the other things, that provide a little bit more richness and body then it all kind of works out. You have a good balance between the acidity level and some of the texture and body coming from other things. And then of course the aromatics come out from, from Shannon. And in this case, and then neither here nor there, some of the aromatics also come from the skin fermented Sauvignon Blanc. And how, um, how are, did you come about finding the vineyards that you want to work with? Um, there are a couple of things there. I, when I was planning this, I, I spent two uh, harvests plotting the daily high and daily low temperatures and rainfall amounts at about 20 different wine growing areas around the world, mainly France, Spain, and then up and down the California coast. And the thought process there was if you're looking for, let's say, Chardonnay, you could say, well, the homeland for Chardonnay is the Burgundy region of France. What does the climate look like there? And how does that map to various points up and down the California coast? And you could do the same thing with Sauvignon Blanc or Albarino or Marsan or whatever. And that will get you at least into the ballpark of where you want to start looking for good vineyards. At least that was my thinking. Um, and then beyond that, you're really looking for vineyards that have a reputation for good farming practices and have had their fruit used in good wines previously and then hope that you can talk them into selling you some of it. But, and some of that, Riley and I leaned on some of the growers that, uh, you know, the, the agricultural groups that we knew that we'd say, you know, we want to have uh, these particular varieties. Here's kind of where our thoughts are, where we'd like to look, what do you guys have? And then we kind of work with them. But we were really lucky to get really good vineyards right off the bat. And sometimes that's hard because a lot of the good vineyards are already spoken for. But I think the fact that both Riley and I had worked at some well-regarded wineries here in Paso um, probably helped our credibility. And I think a lot of the growers were probably intrigued by the notion of really trying to put a fine focus on making good white wines. And so for the, the vineyards that had white fruit in their vineyards, that was interesting for them. So you, you and Excel must be like best friends. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> you, you would get along fantastically with my husband. He <laughs> he loves to he loves a spreadsheet for every single thing he, you know whatever. And whenever I have to do anything data related, I pretty much just give him the information. And I'm like, here, honey, have a good night. You know, <laughs> and, yeah. and excel yeah. at it. You know, he can he can do his spreadsheets. Um, but uh, that but you know what that's 
that's important and that's brilliant in my opinion to to if you want to make a chardonnay you know and it's burgundy then then you're not going to go to a region you're not going to find a vineyard in a region that doesn't have similar similar climate yeah. microclimate soils and, and, and that's one of the great things about the central coast is you can go 30 miles one way or the other and go from quite warm to quite cool you know for for those of us who live here during the summertime, it might be 105 degrees in Paso, but you go over the hill to Cambria, which is about 30 miles away, and it would be 65. Um, so it's pretty dramatic, but I think that's one of the advantages that I have in not owning my own vineyard, is that it does give me the opportunity to pick and choose and find uh, all those places. And I think one of the things you see sometimes is someone has a vineyard and the owner will say, well, you know, I really like Cabernet Sauvignon, but I also like Pinot Noir and I like Chardonnay and I like Riesling and they try to shoehorn everything into the same vineyard. And, you know, there's no vineyard that's gonna be optimal for all those different varieties. And so you end up making trade-offs and compromises when you do that versus being able to pick and choose and say, I'm gonna go here for my Chardonnay and I'm gonna go there for my, my Sauvignon Blanc and I'm gonna go over here for my Albarino, for example. True, absolutely true. That it goes back to the old saying of if you're a jack of all trades, you're a master of none, right? Same, right. same thing with same thing. Mm -hmm. So your tasting room is in Tin City, mm -hmm. which I you know, I mean, we pretty much live in Tin City. Uh, mm -hmm. and in order to go from your tasting room to Onyx where your wines are made, you kind of have to veer past Barrel House. You know, is there are there frequent stops to Barrel House? Are you a uh, no, we actually don't have to go to Barrel House by Barrel House to get uh, to get to Onyx. You can see uh, it, right? It's not too far away. Yeah, I mean, everything <laughs> in the city is, is pretty close. But yeah, there's just a lot of good stuff going on in, in Tin City these days. And whether you're looking for wine or beer or cider or distilled spirits or ice cream, which has been known to be one of my haunts. <laughs> I get I get sidetracked much more often by Negranti's Creamery than I do by Barrel House, actually. Okay. But, uh, you know, and then we got a couple of restaurants there now. Um, McPhee's uh, Cantina is now there, and uh, of course, Six Test Kitchen. You know, they only do dinner, and then there's usually a food truck or two in front of Barrel House. So there are more eating opportunities in the area than there were a couple of years ago, which is great. Yeah, they, they, I had read quite some time ago, um, which made me laugh that. Uh, the majority they did some survey of uh, winemakers and they said that most winemakers uh you know drink ipas and you know and i, I was like oh my god mike and i both we both drink ipas like that that's our thing is, is an ipa um but it's really i think it's more because you're of the red wine you're 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 yeah. tasting that red wine you're tasting and it, it's kind of equivalent to that ipa so that's why i was wondering if if your if your palate is more for your whites which is why you're making these exceptional whites um i was wondering if if that follows through to to you also but now it goes to the ice cream so that's good <laughs> well i mean i i do like beer and you know it's it's interesting as, as you probably know you, you run you go in back when we could go out to restaurants and bars and things like that around here um when it seemed like whenever you met somebody, a winemaker that was hanging out at a, at a restaurant or bar, they were usually drinking beer rather than wine. Um, and at first, I think that's a surprise to people. But, you know, when you're around wine all day long and you're drinking your wine, and you're trying other people's wine and things like that, sometimes just relaxing with a beer is uh is a nice break and so yeah. you do tend to see a lot of winemakers when they're off hours actually drinking beer rather than drinking wine right okay so um tell us in Tin City uh you come in you're actually you you're sharing a tasting room building basically with Turtle Rock <laughs> correct Turtle Rock and Kaleidos so oh, okay. we have, uh, it's the front portion of this building um the same building also has the production area for field recordings winery. And then in the very back is Six Test Kitchen, which is a very high-end, very interesting, creative, one of these, you know, 14 course tasting menu places. It's, it's fabulous. They only serve about 12 people a night, but we are in the front section. Uh, so it's, it's monochrome, Turtle Rock and Kaleidos. And we have some shared spaces, for example, the restroom, sink and stemware washer, cold storage area for bottled wine. 
but we each have our own separate tasting space, um, which is nice. And then, I mean, recently we're all having to pour outdoors, which is the case. So we've got a little patio out there. And so I've been doing all the, the tastings outdoors for most of the last six to nine months. And pre-COVID, mm -hmm. uh, how how can or let's let's go post COVID. We're go, we're going to get there eventually. What is your typical um, policy for tasting? How can they get in? How can they get in to taste these wines? So um, let's take about talk about pre COVID because we'll probably do something similar afterwards. But the in, inner space that we have, the the inside tasting room. Um, set it up basically for by appointment tasting. And my wife did a lot of the, the decor. We really set it up aiming more for a vibe of sitting around a dinner table, drinking wine, wine with friends rather than standing at a bar somewhere. And so I personally lead all the tastings. Um, you know, I kind of walk people through the different wines, tell a little bit of backstory of monochrome, and then really give them an opportunity to ask questions about the wines or the wine making or anything like that. And, um, the inside space, I can hit fit maybe 10 or 12 people max, something like that. So it's a fairly small intimate group. Usually it's more between four and eight people at a time, but it's all done by appointment. People can make appointments on the, uh, on the website, monochrome website. Um, since COVID, I've, we have a little patio and so I've been doing all those tastings outdoors. We have three little tables and I can accommodate three groups of up to about five or six people. And I try to do as much of the same thing outdoors as we would have been indoors. So I lead all the tastings um, at certain scheduled times and then really, again, give people an opportunity to ask questions and learn a little bit more about wine and winemaking. So looking beyond COVID, we'll probably go to something where I maintain that model for indoor tastings and then outdoor tastings. My wife and I have talked about maybe just having kind of a by the, by the glass program outside where people can go outside and order a glass or two of wine and just hang out in the patio and enjoy the day. And you had mentioned before we went um, on, you had mentioned that you are doing virtual tastings currently. So how can somebody do a virtual tasting with you? So they can basically just go on the website, microwines.com, and you can order virtual tasting kits. And so we have uh, the little, the little boxes of five two ounce uh, samples of five of our different wines. Um, a couple of, well, two of the, two of the three that, that I sent you were in, are in that kit, but it's kind of a good representative cross section of the wines that, that I make. And uh, then they can go about booking a virtual tasting appointment. And we do it on Zoom. Uh, I lead all of those. And I try to do it as, again, as much, maintaining as much as I can of the experience that you would have if you were to come to our tasting room in, in Paso. Um, I lead people through the wines, talk a little bit about them, answer any questions that they might have uh, as they taste the wines. Okay, so basically they go on, they place an order, you send them the samples with information on how to schedule, and then they can schedule a time that is convenient for, for them. Anyway. Correct. Okay, perfect. Yeah. perfect. And then yeah, the, only, the only thing that makes it a little bit complex is recently I've been doing able to do it a lot of different times. Once we get back to the tasting room, I'm doing the tastings in the tasting room uh, Friday through Sunday from about 11 to five. So that kind of blocks out those times, but uh, other days, other evenings um, are all possibilities. Okay, so that, that was actually gonna be my next question is in the tasting room, when we're back to normal, what are you, you're just Friday through <clears throat> Sunday? Yeah, I've been Friday through Sunday um, from typically 11 to five, although, during the summertime when we were pouring outdoors, I shifted it in forward to start at 10 rather than 11, just to try to take advantage of the cooler mornings and not bake in the Paso sun when it was 105 in the afternoons. Right. <laughs> okay. So my last question is, how can people uh, find you? What is your website? Are you on social media? What is your you know, main social media site and how can they get in contact with you? So the website is uh, monochromewines.com, plural wines. Um, and um, you know, you can go on and you can you can send emails to me. They basically all come to me. I answer them personally. Um, social media, really 
primarily Instagram and Facebook. I do more on Instagram and then just sort of link it to Facebook. But um, I usually do that. And then, of course, I have a mailing list. And so I'll send out whenever we have a, a special offer going on or different news or an upcoming wine club release or something like that. Uh, I'll send out information to either the general mailing list or the wine club members uh, about it, that information. And do you want to talk about your wine club? What is yeah, so, for? Um, yeah, we have wine club, uh, two releases per year. It's fall and spring. And uh, you can either do Club 8, which is two releases of four bottles, or Club 16, which is two releases of eight bottles. And I also try to give people the opportunity to customize their shipment if they want to. So each time I do a release, there's a default set of wines. It's typically half the new, the new vintage. Um, but I also send everybody information about the other wines that are still available. So if you did want to substitute this for that, or more of this and less for that, whatever, uh, if you let me know, I can usually accommodate that. Uh, if I don't hear from you, then you get the default set of wines. Okay, and, excellent. Uh, we, we have been having pickup parties where we have it catered by someone like La Cosette or Cortile, something like that. But obviously we haven't been able to do that the last several releases due to COVID concerns. Um, hopefully, uh, it's clear we won't be able to do the spring release, but hopefully by next fall, we'll hopefully have made progress enough that we'll be able to get back to, yeah, exactly, to having um, actual pickup parties where we have groups together and let them taste through some of the wines. Well, I just wanna say thank you very much for sharing your wine, sharing your story. Um, my husband, we're gonna enjoy this bottle tonight. We're actually pairing, we're just we're pairing it with cheese. So we're gonna okay. sit and actually relax and enjoy conversation, which is <laughs> tough in, in as a hectic world as it is. Um, but I, these, these wines will definitely be on my social media. They, uh, this one, if the others are any indication, if this is any indication of the others, it, it's spectacular. It really is. It, it is um, a very complex. And so I give you, what your goal is, is, is being presented in that bottle. So thank you very much for taking your time and sharing your information. And uh, one of these days when I'm walking around Tin City, um, we will pop in, we'll schedule an appointment so that we can uh, sit down and, and uh, talk in real, in real life. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. It, it's been a pleasure to, to meet you, if only virtually. And, and certainly, hopefully you'll be able to stop by and uh, we can meet in person sometime. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Have a great yeah. Wine Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, most of them are around here. So <laughs> it's about living in wine country. <laughs> yes. <laughs>